<clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for this wonderful opportunity. I am Lila Rizal, currently working as a CERC postdoctoral research fellow in Biotech Interaction Group within Agriculture and Food in CSIRO. I work on sustainable management of stubble diseases in grain crops. I acknowledge the Durbal and Yagari people, people as, as traditional custodians of the Brisbane and recognize any other people or families with connection to the land of the Brisbane region where I carried my research. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of Brisbane city and Queensland. I'm from a small town located in the southern east part of Bhutan. It is a small kingdom located between India and China. Bhutan has a rich biodiversity because we have policies that conserve the environment. In fact, 60% of the country is environmentally protected. And so Bhutan became one of the, one of the few carbon negative countries in the world. I completed my bachelor's degree in education from Samsi College of Education in Bhutan, master's by research on mushroom from Mae Fa Luang University in Thailand, and PhD on entomopathogenic fungi and its interactions with insects from the University of Queensland in 2022. Because of my curiosity on fungi and passion to Passion to learn continuously, I was offered a um, scholarship to do um, MSc in my medical mycology from the Uni University of Exeter in 2023. In Bhutan, I was a higher secondary teacher. After I submitted my PhD thesis in 2022, I secured a position to work in Queensland, uh, UQ, and in the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries on sustainable management of fungal diseases on cotton. I also worked in CSIRO on management of invasive aquatic weed called Kovumba carolina using insect biocontrol. Currently, I work as a postdoctoral fellow uh, in sustainable disease management uh, group in Canberra. Now let me present on entomopathogenic fungi. Entomopathogenic fungi are those fungi which infect the insect and make them look like zombie. 90 genera and 700 species are involved with entomopathogenicity, but only a few members of the entomopteral and hyphomycetes have been well studied. The life cycle of entomopathogenic fungi consists of two phases, the asexual phase where the fungus break into the cuticle of the insect and spread its hyphae throughout the insect body. The fungi continue to reproduce asexually by producing conidia, which are asexual spores, as you can see on the zombie beetle. The second phase is the sexual phase uh, on which the fungus infect the uh, insect and emerge into a fruiting bodies. Uh, you can see it in the right side, uh, right side, the larvae has been completely zombified by the fungus Cordyceps species. Now I'm going to talk on the popular sexual entomopathogenic fungi in the genus Cordyceps. Cordyceps became very famous in the zoo, The Last of Us. But in Asia, Cordyceps has always been very popular. If you want to explore more on this, please visit The Last of Us in British Science. The name Cordyceps means club head in Latin, and it refers to a genus of fungi that includes over 800 different species. In 2007, based on the molecular evidences, the group Cordyceps was split up into several different groups. One of these remained as Cordyceps, but some of them grouped into 
Ophiocordyceps, Metacordyceps, and Elaphocordyceps. Sorry. Uh, cordyceps, but cordyceps in Asia has been always popular because of its traditional medicine. Perhaps the most famous cordyceps is Cordyceps sinensis, which is one whose name has been changed to Ophiocordyceps. This fungus is very interesting because it is the most expensive parasite in the world. This means that Ophiocordyceps sinensis has become very soft after, sought after. Partly, this is because the distribution of this species is very restricted. It is only found in Himalayas at an elevation of 3,000 to 5,000 meter, and they are only found in some parts of China, Bhutan, Nepal, Thailand, uh, India, and the Tibetan Plateau. Another reason of your cordyceps sinensis is expensive is because it is host specific to the ghost moth, which are only found specifically in the Himalayas. Although some researchers were able to grow this moth in laboratory condition after many trials, but they were not able to generate of your cordyceps fruiting body successfully till date. In Asia, Ophiocordyceps sinensis is often consumed uh, uh, in alcohol or in hot water or in milk. Uh, it is often soaked up in uh, this liquid for, uh, for an hour and then uh, taken it uh, uh, to cure uh, many ailments like tuberculosis uh, uh, and also to boost energy. The reason it is so expensive is because it is used in traditional medicine. It is consumed by soaking in hot water, milk, or local medic, local locally made alcohol for an hour before consuming. Himalayan claim that the fungus can cure cancer, fatigue, relieve chronic pain, and tuberculosis. It has also other numerous reported anti-inflammatory, anti-aging, and other health benefits. It has even been claimed to be the secret of eternal youth. Nonetheless, it is also known as Himalayan Viagra in the West because of its reported aphrodisiac qualities. However, I should point out that until comprehensive research has, is carried out, there is no evidence as for this yet. So is there any truth to all these claims? There are quite a lot of research paper regarding the potential health benefits of cordyceps, and these paper found some anti-cancer properties. One of the more interesting compound is called cordycepin. Recent research has shown that the molecule cordycepin switches on a cellular protein called AMPK, which does have anti-cancer property. But unfortunately, the study also found the cell that cell converts some of the cordycepin to another chemical called CTP. This causes problem with cell growth and division. Here in Australia, we also have a native species called Cordyceps ganii. It was discovered in Tasmania. There are some reports that it may also have similar properties to Ophiocordyceps sinensis, and it may also be a good source of bioactive compounds and secondary metabolites. Another species, Cordyceps militaries, is much more easier to grow commercially and is also regarded to have health benefits. This species can also be found in Australia. Now I'm going to tell you about the asexual entomopathogenic fungi, some of which are popular insect biocontrol agent. Stephen Rice at the Queensland Department Department of Agriculture and Fisheries has explored their biocontrol properties. And I was a part 
of his project as an intern. This project is about using entomopathogenic fungi to control a notorious insect paste on chicken. Uh, it is called laser melworm. This paste is a major paste in chicken farms. Fast number of larvae and adults are found in bedding litter, particularly under feed pens. It is also a vector for various bacterial pathogens which cause diseases in humans. Additionally, it damages chicken house floor and wall and adds up expenses. Chemical insecticide has been, have been used to control this paste, but but this paste has already developed resistant to all the chemical pesticide. The most sustainable way to control this notorious paste is by searching for a biocontrol agent within the population of this paste. In the first phase, we collect laser mealworm from the chicken farm. Then isolate entomopathogenic fungi randomly, identify them and test them for their pathogenicity and virulency against the mealworm. After we identify the most virulent isolate, we identify it and then we mass produce it. Uh, first, we prepare the uterian broth and uh, we inoculate mycelium and in incubate for four days. And then once the mycelium fully covers the nutrient broth, it is transferred to rice, uh, boiled rice, uh, and which are grown in the growth bag for 14 to 21 days. Uh, and then they are sifted to the drying room uh, for five to seven days. And after that, the, uh, the spores are separated from the rice using the harvester. Uh, and the final product is the spore powder. The spore powder can then be applied to a chicken seed and in field trials, it has proved proven to be more effective than chemical pesticides in controlling laser mealworm. Here you can see the results of the trial. The blue bar is the chemical pesticide and in the red is the untreated control. And you can see that the Biberia treatment was more effective than metarasium. In fact, fungal treatments were better than chemical pesticide. This Biberia bacillus isolate hasn't been commercialized, but the results so far are promising and interesting. Entomopathogenic fung fungus Bivaria bassiana is not only effective in controlling laser mealworm, but also presented synergistic interactions between three insecticides. In the US, there is already a product registered based on Bivaria bassiana, although we don't have it here in Australia. We do have a product registered called Green Guard, which uses metarasium fungi and is registered for use on locust and grasshoppers. I have showed you that there are also lots of good things about fungi. They can be a source of environmentally friendly biopesticides. They can provide us with useful bioactive compounds and maybe a cure for cancer. There are a lot of things that we don't know about fungi, and that is also exciting and interesting. I was inspired to find out more on the hidden diversity, virulence, and sexuality in, of entomopathogenic fungi in my PhD, because in my country, Bhutan, because even my country, Bhutan, host of your cordyceps sinensis, the most expensive parasite in the world. We commonly call it the gold of Himalayas. So 
During my PhD, I collected soil samples across different vegetations, including rainforest and dry sclerophyll and agricultural areas. But I found the highest diversity of entomopathogenic fungi in suburban garden soils in Brisbane city. In this picture, I'm collecting soil sample from Parent Park in Tua. I brought the soil samples back to the lab and I placed different insects on top of the soil. I used three different insects, all notorious insect pests, diamondback moth, red rust flower beetle, and cotton stainer bug to bait entomopathogenic fungi. These photos on the right showed that the uh, entomopathogenic fungi in soil infected all of these insects. Here you can see infected diamondback moth larvae. On the top, the infected fungi are bivaria species, and on the bottom are metarhizium uh, species. These two groups of entomopathogenic fungi are closely related to cordyceps. Bivaria and metarhizium species are the most popular entomopathogenic fungi used in as used to control insect space. Uh, across the world. We recovered several different species. Among them, one was Cordyceps from Suburban Garden in Brisbane. As part of my PhD work, we used whole genome sequencing on all the isolate that I collected from the field. And the first step in this process is to extract the DNA in the molecular laboratory. Traditionally, mycologists have used four small regions of DNA and the combination of markers, the B-locus nuclear intergenic region, trans elongation factors, and poly RNA polymerase to identify fungi. Each of these is around 700 bases long, and they are also bits of DNA that code for genes which make them kind of conserved. So what I did is compare that approach to the whole genome approach. On the left here, you can see that when we use the four genes, all these samples came out the same. But on the right, you can see that when we used whole genome, these samples all separated into different genetic groups. And the bottom photo showed that these genetic groups were closely related to their morphology. In Metarhizium guizhaoans, the four gene approach separated the strains into two groups. But when we looked with genome data, there were three genetic groups. And it turned out that every group of entomopathogenic fungi that we looked at this way was the same. In this instance, the four gene approach suggested one group, but the whole genome approach suggested five. So when we use whole genome, we uncover more genetic diversity than the traditional approach did. We are not sure whether all of these are new species. I still need to work on it, but uh, this result uh, shows up that we have greater diversity of entomopathogenic fungi here in Australia, and they are potential source of bioactive compound and biopesticide. Details of these results can be extensively found in this paper, which was published last year. Then what I did was uh, to try to figure out whether those groups we found in whole genome sequences were different species, we sequenced an assembled genome of 14 isolates collected from soil in Queensland, Australia, and assembled, and each was genotyped at their mating type locus. We reconstructed a phylogeny across the global diversity of Biberia bassiana available on the NCBI SRA databases, and isolates from Queensland form a distinct clade to isolate sample from across the world, including another single isolate from Australia in Tasmania. 
we cross isolate from the different genetic groups and use vegetative compatibility. Vegetative compatibility is the ability of the hyphae of two individual fungal isolate to fuse together and form viable heterocaryons. As part of this work, I try to produce fruiting bodies to assess uh, sexual reproduction because uh, Biberia bassiana is closely related to cordyceps and cordyceps produces fruiting bodies. So in order to check uh, if Biberia bassiana has also the potential to produce fruiting bodies, I experimented and after several uh, months of trying, I found a fruiting body uh, on Biberia bassiana, but unfortunately, Perithesia, and also we found Perithesia, like structure, but no evidences of fully developed sexual structures such as Peritesia, SI, or Escospore were found. Further to confirm the recombination, we used analysis of linkage disequilibrium to test for past evidence of recombination. Two of the genetic groups from Queensland had low indices of association and were reticulated in network analysis, which support recombination within these genetic groups. In contrast, isolate from different genetic groups were not compatible when crossed and no evidence for recombination between the genetic groups. Our result indicated that Biberia bassiana is a diverse complex of multi-cryptic species, indicating more diversity of Biberia than we currently have. And each of these species has the potential to be a new option for developing an ecologically compatible biopesticide. This work has been submitted to the journal for publication. Some isolate in different genetic groups were tested for virulence against diamondback moth larvae, another notorious based on uh, brassica crops. Their entomopathogenic fungal virulence against diamondback moth uh, was tested based on temperature and host starvation. For both Biberia bassiana and Metarhizium species, isolate from the same genetic cluster demonstrated similar level of virulence against the host insects. And those which were from different genetic, uh, different genetic clusters, their virulence was variable. Extensive details of this work are presented in this paper that was published in 2022. Lastly, not the least, I would have not achieved anything without the support and motivation from others. I would like to acknowledge the University of Queensland for PhD scholarship and Australian Centre for International Agriculture for the fundings. I would like to thank my supervisor, uh, uh, who extensively contributed uh, in my PhD, uh, Professor Gimme Walter, Professor Mike Furlong, Professor uh, Elizabeth Atkin, Dr. James Harriwood, and Dr. Dean Brooks. Uh, I would also like to extend my uh, heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Linda Smith for giving me a uh, uh, because I secured a position in Queensland. Uh, Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, and uh, it was, and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to extend my knowledge on plant pathogen. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Matthew Purcell for letting me work uh, in health and biosecurity uh, to manage aquatic wheat. wheat. And lastly, not the least, I would like to thank my current supervisor, Dr. Uh, Susan Sprague and Dr. Luke uh, Barrett, 
in CSIRO for this, uh, for letting me present and for giving me extra time to pre prepare this presentation. I would also like to thank uh, Queensland Mycological Society for uh, this wonderful opportunity for me to, for me to present this uh, talk today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Leela. That was really um, interesting and some great work you've done there. Do we have any questions? Lil? Why don't the chicken eat those bugs? <laughs> Why don't the chicken eat the bugs? <laughs> um, I think chicken eat the bugs, but they are so much. There are so many bugs and uh, rather than the food, I think they are the best and they in fact, uh, they are found under the litter, uh, under the feed pen. So um, I don't think they, they can eat or even if they eat, it is the population of the bug is so much. Uh, they are rather the best than the feed for chicken. Thank you, Leela. We have another question. Uh, yes, the people that were trying to grow those moths for the cordyceps, but it didn't take off. What was the limiting factor? Like, did they not have enough space, or like, was it was were they in the wrong country, like the wrong environment, that sort of thing? Do you know? Do you know any, Do you know any more about that? Yeah, because uh, the cordyceps sinensis is uh, very specific to a certain altitude, as well as it is host specific. It only infects some kind of moth. Uh, which are only found in Himalayas at that altitude. And uh, people are, and then all the infection happens under the ground in the soil. So uh, people are unable to know what is happening, at what temperature the fungi infect the moth, even though like uh, people are able to grow those moth in the laboratory condition um, Nowadays, they are unable to produce protein bodies because uh, there are certain parameters uh, which are uh, which people are not able to uh, identify or yeah because of all those reasons. Temperature could be the one reason, the host could be the other reason, and the interaction between the host and the pathogen could be the other reason. So there are so many factors. And since all these activities, the infection happens under the soil. So it is very hard to, uh, to grow them in the lab. But I did try uh, growing them in the lab, uh, uh, the asexual Biberia bassiana, and I did uh, get uh, fruiting bodies uh, similar to uh, cordyceps, but unfortunately, uh, I could not get uh, the well-formed uh, peritesia or escospore, and so I could not claim that they are the sexual fruiting bodies. Thanks, yeah. Leela. Um, another question from Vanessa Ryan. She said, very interesting talk. Thank you. Are you developing these biocontrols made from our local species? for just Australian use, or are they for overseas use as well? Uh, to my understanding, like uh, we have borrowed uh, quite a lot of bio, uh, bio fungal biopesticide from other countries. But uh, what I feel is we can, we can export, like uh, there are so many, we have potential to develop them as a biocontrol here, our own isolate. Uh, and I feel like since these fungi are organism, they need certain like temperature, you know, certain kind of environment where they can infect. Uh, so if we take them to another uh, country or in another environment, I feel like they may not perform as well, as much as they can perform here in our own localities. 
So uh, it is always good to find our own um, biocontrol agent rather than borrowing from another country. Thanks, Thanks Leela. Leela. Another question? Hey, um, great talk. I was just wondering, there was some data there about temperature and mortality. Um, I'm just wondering if the, I don't know if I'm misinterpreting the data, but are there implications for that in terms of like climate change and, you know, the sort of insect extinction event, event that we're sort of going through at the moment? Uh, there are so many implications. Uh, um, so many changes are happening in the environment uh, currently. And I, I believe that that will definitely impact. But, uh, but in my experiment, uh, in the paper that I presented, what I was uh, trying to look into uh, was temperature, like temperature has a greater role when the fungi is infecting insects. At certain temperature, it can really like uh, shoot off its, its infection process uh, and compared to the host starvation, like even the host is like so weak, the temperature was like leading in uh, in helping the fungus to infect. So those kind of uh, results were presented in that paper. But definitely, yes, uh, the increase in global temperature ha would have impact on the fungal virulence and pathogenicity. Hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Um, an interesting comment there from, from Tom May, which I'll read out. Great work, Leela. Very interesting to see the uncovering of the diversity among the cryptic species for Cordyceps gunnii. I think there is a chance that what is called this species in China is misidentified. This means that if there's been if it has been shown to have medicinal value, these results would not apply to the Australian fungus. It is now known as Drecomeria gunnii, and it is not closely related to the medicinally important Ophiocordyceps. So I would caution about use of the Australian species. It may even be toxic when consumed. There is also the issue of mass harvesting from Australian forests, especially when the price per kilogram you showed. Would be good for QMAS to follow up about the harvesting of wild cordyceps in Australia. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, Thank any you other very questions? much. Oh, I have another question. Hi. Um, I thought that was a really fascinating talk. I'm just curious, when you're doing uh, the whole genome sequencing, how do you account for uh, karyogamy um, in your fungi? Um, we did the whole genome sequences and we used the reference genome, uh, which were already published. And then that's how we explored the genome of the fungi. And because like uh, the multilocus phylogeny multi-locus system uses only the small fragment of the DNA. And we thought like it was not covering uh, the whole, um, it was not giving the high resolution uh, to separate the uh, diversity within the strains. So that's how we did, like we use the reference genome uh, of closely related species. And then uh, we uh, we also relate we also relate it with the ideas and then yeah I hope I answered. But the detailed uh, information of all these things are in the paper that I presented. Uh, it's already published. That was beyond the scope of my understanding, but we're getting a, a firm nod from the, the the question asker. So I think you've 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 answered the question. Yeah, <laughs> great. Are there any other questions? No, great. Thank you so much, Leela. We really enjoyed your your speak tonight, your talk tonight. Um, really informative and um, exciting stuff. Exciting work you've been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.